the title of our discussion, our study uh, today is the baptism of Paul. The baptism of Paul. And, and there are a number of ways that uh, one can understand that. We will see uh, what we will cover. But uh, the baptism of Paul really is all about the, the person of Paul. If you, if you look at the scriptures, if, if you look at history even, you find that the conversion of Saul to become the Apostle Paul was one of the most amazing and unexpected stories in the Bible. Totally unexpected. Uh, so outstanding that even the disciples found it hard to believe that Paul's conversion was genuine initially. It took Barnabas to come and, and tell them, listen, this is for real. This is what happened in Damascus and this is what went on for them to really accept Paul's conversion. Uh, Paul was handpicked by Christ to be the apostles to the Gentiles primarily. And it's a remarkable uh, conversion story. It's a remarkable experience how he actually met with Jesus on the way to Damascus. You don't find many accounts uh, in the scriptures that are similar to that. And the impact that Paul, the apostle Paul has had on the world, not just on the Christian church, but on the world is very hard to actually measure accurately. Look at it, look at it this way. Here we are 2000 years later, talking about Paul, discussing, studying the writings of Paul, the effect and influence of how God used this man is so far reaching in its impact on history that it, it, it is quite incredible. And it all starts right there in that experience where Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. God used him in such a marvelous way that he left a permanent mark on Christianity, not just on Christianity, on the whole world and the effect and influence of Christianity on the world. But particularly for believers, Paul holds this, this very special place. Uh, his effect is on the faith, the practice, the theology, the understanding, and the preaching of the Christian message, the Christian faith, and the gospel. He's one of the most well-known figures in, in history. So th with that in mind, it's, it's, it's helpful to then uh, delve into the, the life, the practice, and the experience of Paul. It is of great significance. And while we have a fair amount of information about the Apostle Paul, we actually uh, have less information than, than we would like. And we'll look at that a little bit today in relation to the baptism of Paul. But this component today, I want to focus on the baptism of Paul. I'm not going to talk too much about his, his uh, conversion or his experience, his preaching, that uh, we, we're aware of this. But there's one component in the life of Paul, dealing particularly with the baptism of Paul, that really, you know, caught my attention. And I thought I never really gave that much, uh, you know, thought or attention and, and it caused me to do a little bit of digging. So this is, this is the shared result. Of what I'm sharing today is the, is the result of this digging. A little bit of an investigation that has a practical bearing and practical relevance. And this is where we're heading. Our first verse, talking about baptism and the baptism of Paul, actually comes from uh, Hebrews. Here it is. Hebrews chapter uh, 6. And we will look at verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Here the apostle tells us, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Apostle here, and uh, most uh, people uh, believe and understand that this was the Apostle Paul uh, writing uh, the epistle to the Hebrews. The Apostle here is laying out uh, a progression of truth. He's basically talking about the, the foundational principles when he talks about the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And then he recounts some of these principles in order to build on them and move forward unto perfection, as he says. He says, not laying again the foundation of, and then he lists a number of doctrines. And the one I want to focus in today is baptism. He says baptisms here, and that's understood. Uh, there's a baptism of water. There's a baptism of the spirit. There's a baptism of fire. We're not going to get into the different baptisms today, but baptism in general, according to the apostle here, is a foundational doctrine. It's basic. Uh, foundational and basic doesn't mean it's not important because the foundation is what you actually build on, is what you establish at the beginning, and then you build on that. So if the foundation is, is off or wrong, that will affect your building later on. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so a foundational teaching, doctrine, understanding is this baptism, the doctrine of baptism. Uh, we want to see why that is, because the questions we want to ask are as follows. What was Paul's experience with baptism? Because 
if it's foundational, that means it's at the beginning of the journey. That means it's at the start. It's something that you encounter, something that you meet at the commencement of your Christian journey, the commencement of the gospel. What was Paul's experience with baptism? What was his practice when it comes to baptism? And what was his teaching or theology when it comes to baptism? Because actually all three are related. So with the title of our study, when we talk about uh, the baptism of Paul, uh, like I said, very little is mentioned about the baptism of Paul. We'll visit that incident. But when I say the baptism of Paul, it's actually not very clear what I mean, because it could be the baptism that Paul received when he was converted and became a believer, the baptism of Paul. It also could be the baptism of Paul that he administered, the baptism that Paul administered, the baptism that uh, Paul baptized people with. Or it could also mean the baptism that Paul taught about, the baptism of Paul, as in what Paul taught about baptism. Uh, which one of these three am I referring to? It's actually all three, because all three are related. They're connected to each other. The baptism that Paul received, the baptism that Paul administered, the baptism that Paul taught in his theology. All three are related. And all of this is foundational. It's basic. It's fundamental. It's, it, it is at the commencement of the Christian journey, as we see here from the book of Hebrews. So, like I said earlier, uh, today we'll look at this investigation, this threefold investigation into the baptism of Paul. And the fact that all three are related and interlinked helps us understand where there is perhaps a little bit of uh, information in the one. Uh, the others help fill in the gap to present a wholesome and complete picture when it comes to the baptism of Paul. And seeing this is the, the baptism of Paul, uh, like we said, the, the fact that he's such a central figure, handpicked by Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles, is of significance for us then to understand baptism correctly, to make sure we have the right foundation, is to look at the baptism of Paul. If he was used in such a marvelous, significant way by God to establish uh, the gospel and to, to spread the gospel to the reaches of the Roman Empire and even down through the, to the reaches of, of time and history, down to our day, by preserving his writings and his contribution, contributions to the New Testament, it is all the more reason for us to really examine, do we have the right foundation? Do we have the right understanding? Let's look at this foundation of baptism in, from the lens or, or from the perspective of the baptism of Paul. So this is kind of the, the, the scope. This is the, the picture, what we, wanna, what we wanna do. And of course, uh, we have to start at the beginning with the story of the conversion of Saul. You remember it was on the way to Damascus that he was converted. I wanna zero in on the record that we have about his baptism. And this is recorded in Acts chapter nine and verses 17 and 18, when Jesus, of course, uh, instructed Ananias to go to Paul to pray for him, and this encounter between Ananias and Paul, after Paul spent three days blinded uh, after he saw Jesus on the way to Damascus. So this is the, the, the lead up here. We pick it up in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that, uh, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. It's interesting, very brief record here of what happened as far as the baptism is concerned. It just says, and he was baptized. Luke records the conversation between uh, Paul and Ananias. Uh, and what Ananias particularly said, Paul didn't say much really uh, in this account, but Ananias told him and reminded him that he was sent by the one that he actually saw in the way to the man. That's Jesus. The focus here is Jesus. Jesus is the key figure. He says, the Lord Jesus, the one that appeared to you, he's the one that sent me. And the purpose is so you can receive your sight. So the source of this whole experience, the conversion of Saul, the sending of uh, uh, Ananias, the Paul having his sight restored, Paul becoming a believer. The source of all of this is Jesus working. That's a key component here I want us uh, not to miss. Ananias highlights this. So Paul receiving his sight would be a result of Jesus. He's the source of this. Not only that, but being filled with the Holy Spirit is also from Jesus. Now, I'm not going to go to the time now today to prove that uh, Jesus is the Spirit. We see that uh, repeatedly throughout the scriptures. Uh, the Lord is that spirit, the Bible tells us. Jesus, when uh, talking about sending the comforter, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
So the identity of the Spirit is not a different one to Christ. It's the Spirit and the presence of the Father and the Son because the Father is in the Son and that's how we can have them both. The Spirit is not anyone other than the Father in the Son. Uh, that's, that's as far as the identity of the Spirit. But the, the, the emphasis here of Ananias is on Jesus repeatedly. And, and this, is a, this is worth noting. Jesus is the one who sent Ananias. Jesus appeared to Paul. Jesus is going to give him his sight. Jesus is going to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And then he carries out this promise. Uh, he, he touches him. He, uh, something falls from his eyes. And he receives his sight. And as soon as that happens, he arose and was baptized. Well, guess what? The baptism also has to do with Jesus in this context, because Jesus is the whole focus. Jesus is the, is the whole element. Jesus has to do with everything here, including the baptism. As a matter of fact, uh, Ananias is the one who actually told Paul what he must do. Uh, when Jesus appeared to Paul on the way to Damascus, uh, his instruction to Paul, he didn't actually tell Paul what to do. He, other than he told him, go into the city and it shall be told thee what you will do. And all of us go and you will receive instruction. And then he sent that instruction, of course, uh, to Ananias. And we will see in a minute that it was Ananias who told Paul that he needs to be baptized, that it was time for him now to be baptized. We'll see that in a minute. We'll get to this. But don't miss this significant point. Even the baptism in this context actually has something to do with Jesus. Now we see that uh, particularly there is one component about the identity of Christ that Paul believed and accepted, which he rejected before. In Acts 9.20, just a few verses later, it says, and straight away, speaking about Paul, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So from the context, we see it was all about Jesus. Uh, it was leading to a purpose, to a particular uh, objective. Paul was being led and guided by the spirit to come to the place to receive Jesus and believe in Jesus and accept him and recognize him as the son of God. Everything was shaping towards this. And so the very first testimony, the very first sermon, the very first witness that Paul gave as a Christian, as a believer, was about the sonship of Christ, that Christ is indeed the Son of God. Which tells us that before Paul was converted, he fought against Christ being the Son of God. He rejected that and he, he persecuted people who believed that Christ is the Son of God. This is what made all the difference. But we want to focus particularly on the baptism, like I said, because Paul doesn't, uh, pardon me, Luke, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, does not record for us how Paul was baptized. In other words, he doesn't tell us, well, like they went to the water and this is what happened and he was baptized in this name or he doesn't record this. But there is enough evidence in the story and in the rest of the book and in the writings of Paul, actually, to figure out the baptism of Paul as to how it was done. Now, why, why are we saying how it was done? Because this is basic. This is foundational. Today, there's, there's some ideas, differing ideas about baptism. Uh, how is baptism to be done? Uh, in what name or in whose name is baptism to be carried out? Can we learn something about the baptism of Paul or from the baptism of Paul that helps answer this question? And the answer, of course, is definitely yes. Now, years later, this is the part where I was saying Ananias actually invited Paul. Uh, years later, Paul actually recounts his story, his conversion, his experience, uh, and his baptism in particular. Uh, he records it, or Luke records it, but it's uh, in Acts chapter 22. And verse 16. Remember, we're doing a bit of an investigative uh, Bible study here to understand teaching, and we'll see the practical relevance uh, as well. Acts 22, verse 16. Paul recounting what Ananias told him. He says, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is Ananias speaking to Paul, and Paul is repeating and recounting this. In other words, he's saying, When Ananias came, this is what he told me. He told me, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, this was not available, or this little detail, calling on the name of the Lord, was not recorded in Acts 9, but now it's recorded in Acts 22. Luke is the same author. Paul was baptized, like everyone else in those days. This is a point to keep in mind. Paul, the apostle, was baptized, just like all the others were baptized, all the other Christian believers, including Ananias, who then administered the baptism to Paul. And that's now the first instance of the baptism of Paul when he received it. Paul was baptized in the same way that all the other Christians were baptized in those days. Now, calling on the name of the Lord here, this should, this should remind us of a very similar phrase that actually Peter gave on the day of Pentecost when people asked what they ought to do. We're going to look at this verse in a minute. But the words of Ananias, match up with the words of Peter. 
Because the, the question we're asking is, how was Paul baptized and in whose name was he baptized? And it actually becomes very clear from the evidence in, the, in context as we're building this case here, that Paul was baptized in the name of Jesus by Ananias. That's what Ananias means when he says, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, uh, watch where your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So he's telling Paul, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. And when he did this, the first thing he accepted and believed and preached was that Jesus is the Son of God. So the Son of God has something to do with the conversion of Paul, receiving his sight and his baptism. That's what we're saying. Paul was actually baptized in the name of Jesus by Ananias. Now, the parallel, like I said, with the words of Peter is very significant. Let's review these words of Peter uh, for a minute here. And uh, just hear me out if, if somebody's starting to say, mm, oh, I'm not so sure I, I agree with you yet. Let's just hear the evidence out because there is a very compelling case as to why we're saying uh, what we're saying. Here's how Peter puts it in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. When the people asked him, men and brethren, what shall we do? They heard the sermon of Peter. They were convicted. Here is his answer, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is the first sermon recorded in the book of Acts as far as in the New Testament era or in the, since the day of Pentecost. This was on the day of Pentecost, but in, in the time of the kingdom of God. Now it's been established on the day of Pentecost. The first sermon in the New Testament, Peter preaching, the conclusion of the sermon is this appeal, this invitation when the people were convicted for them to repent and to be baptized. And then he tells them how they were to be baptized. They were to be baptized in someone's name, in the name of Jesus. Actually, a little earlier in the sermon, if you recall, or if you read the account, you find that Peter tells them, he quotes and he says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there is a connection, calling on the name of the Lord, being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Ananias told Paul, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. So it's not a great stretch to consider, well, Paul must have been baptized in the same way that all these other people were baptized, all these other early Christians, in the name of the Lord Jesus, because Luke is the author of the entire book. Now, we know from the story, of course, on the day of Pentecost, that about 3,000 people were baptized on that day, the day of Pentecost, uh, you know, uh, the appeal of Peter, the instruction of Peter, about uh, 3,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus. There are actually lots of baptisms that occurred in the book of Acts. You know, sometimes we quote uh, the four uh, records, uh, instances where baptisms were done in the name of Jesus, forgetting that these four are not just four baptisms. These are four records of multiple baptisms. The first one was 3,000 people in the name of the Lord. Keep in mind, that Luke was Paul's traveling companion. Dr. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, is all, of course the author of the Gospel of Luke as well. Acts is part two, letter two of, of his uh, twofold writing there. Uh, Luke was Paul's traveling companion. It is through Luke and because of what Luke records that we know anything about Paul's background, Paul's conversion, and the experience and uh, practice of Paul early on. Without the record of Luke in the book of Acts about Paul, we would have no clue who this person is. All we would have is, is these letters uh, to the Romans and the Corinthians from, from an individual that we don't know. Uh, who's this Paul writing to, Rome, uh, to the Romans and the Corinthians and, and to Hebrews? What, who is this person? Where did he, Luke is the answer. Luke is the one who sheds light on the, the way that Paul was handpicked by Christ. And this is why Luke is very careful in recording Paul's conversion and ministry. He's careful, careful to record some very important details about baptism as well. Not just the baptism of Paul, but baptism in general, which Paul, when he became a member of the body of Christ, also received. And then we will see also administered. We will we'll get to that. But let's look at a, a couple of other examples as to the uh, multitude of baptisms recorded in the book of Acts by Luke. Paul's traveling companion, which were all done in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's why I'm saying it's a very compelling case when you ask, well, how was Paul baptized or in whose name was he baptized? It was in the name of the Lord Jesus because it's consistent with all the other baptisms in the book of Acts as recorded by Luke. Here is the next one in Acts chapter 8 uh, and verse 14 down to 16. Acts 8, 14 to 16. Uh, this is Philip in Samaria where, Samar where the Samaritans received the gospel. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, 
prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the believers in Samaria, which were actually, it doesn't give us a figure as far as a number, but you, when you read the story, you get the idea that it was a good portion. I'm not going to say everyone in Samaria, but a good portion of the people of Samaria accepted the gospel and were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is how Philip administered baptism. Why is that? Because that's how Philip would have received baptism when he was baptized by whoever taught him the gospel. So the the connection between the reception of the baptism and the practice of administering baptism are, con are connected. That's why we're looking at Paul's reception of the baptism. We're going to look in a minute at how he administered baptism and see the connection and the case is building. So Peter and John come down to Samaria, of course, when they hear the good news, they come and pray for the believers. And this, of course, is the encounter that Peter then has with Simon uh, Magus, who wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit and was uh, rebuked for that. Now, don't forget, Philip, is also the same person who a little later baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, if you recall that story. And he baptized him because the eunuch says, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He took him to the water and he baptized him. Well, here's a question. Guess in what name did Philip baptize this eunuch? It would have to be in the same way that he baptized the believers in Samaria in the name of the Lord Jesus. So then in the next chapter, in chapter 9, where Luke, the same author, is recording the conversion and the baptism of the Apostle Paul, guess what is, uh, you know, to be understood from the context when it comes to the baptism of Paul and in whose name it is. It is in the name of the Lord Jesus as well. Because Ananias told him, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord. Same words as Peter said in his first sermon, where 3,000 people were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So the, the evidence is compelling, like I said. That's not the only place. Uh, here is another one. Uh, with Peter now, we'll go back to Peter. And this is the account with the story of Cornelius and his household. Acts 10, 48 is just what I want to pinpoint here. Uh, here's how, how Peter puts it. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. What had happened was uh, Peter came to Cornelius' house uh, after being persuaded by the vision that he received from Jesus. You know, the the animals and in, in the coming down in the sheet three times and he was going to a gentile house so this was something that was breaking new ground as far as peter was concerned he goes to them he preaches the gospel to them cornelius and his household actually if you if you look at the account there you find that there were many in the household so this was this wasn't just cornelius it was cornelius his friends his family and uh, the bible records that they were many when peter went into the house he found many he preached to them jesus they received the spirit the spirit came upon them so peter says well let's baptize them because they're receiving the same spirit as we did on the day of pentecost how, how can we not baptize them so they took them they baptized them in water and how they did it was in the same way that peter and the disciples did on the day of pentecost in the name of the lord jesus uh, this is how peter did it of course consistent with his uh, practice luke records this and consistency requires us to understand that therefore Paul baptized by Ananias who would have been baptized in the same way that's why he administered baptism in the same way he would have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus so this then brings us to the next point now we've we've looked at some compelling evidence in relation to the baptism of Paul it would have been consistent with everything that is recorded in the Bible uh, particularly in the book of Acts specifically is where we're focusing uh, it's consistent because it's the same author because this is how Christ led his church to operate and to behave. The next piece of evidence in this, in this uh, compelling puzzle that we're building, or as the picture is developing, is the baptism of Paul when it comes to the baptism that Paul administered. Because, you have to think about it this way, and we already mentioned this, the baptism that Paul received, or how Paul was baptized, would have influenced how Paul was to administer baptism. That's, that's, how you, that's how he really learned. He, he entered into the body of Christ in this way. So when he's sent out as an apostle, as a minister, as a preacher of the gospel, he would also, in his practice, in his behavior, carry out what he had experienced. Now we see this in Acts chapter 19. Let's look at this story, a familiar one, very relevant in this context, as, as we see now. Phase two of the baptism of Paul. Paul administering baptism. Verse one of Acts 19, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Spirit since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. Verse 3, 
And he said unto them, And to what then were ye baptized? And they said unto, the, unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. These believers, 11 of them, if you read the account there, uh, had not received the gift of the Spirit. Paul encounters them, and, and this exchange, as we just read, ends up in them being rebaptized, or now baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is Paul now administering baptism. Paul now is operating and behaving as, a, as an apostle, as a preacher, as an evangelist. And he meets with these believers, and because they did not understand certain things, he teaches them, he instructs them, he takes them and he baptizes them again, and he baptizes them with the, with the full light and knowledge and understanding of that they didn't have because they only understood John's teaching and preaching and John's baptism. And when he administers baptism, he does it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Does that give us uh, the, an insight? Or does that tell us something about how Paul himself must have received baptism? It most certainly does. The two are consistent. If Paul baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, it is because he was baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus by Ananias, who must have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus himself which consistently ma matches up with how Peter and the apostles baptized from the day of Pentecost onward in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you can add up the numbers here. There's a lot of baptisms. There are thousands of baptisms. 3,000 day of Pentecost, uh, many in Samaria, many in Cornelius' household, and now by Paul himself at, uh, at uh, where, is, where is this location here? We just, we just read about uh, his, uh, he's in Ephesus. That's, that's the 11 people that were baptized there. Uh, in, in Ephesus. All these people are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, inspiration also uh, affirms this. If, if you're familiar with the book Acts of the Apostles uh, from Spirit of Prophecy, you find that it actually comments on this and says this, these people were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That's what the scripture says. That's what the book of Acts reveals to us. So this is as far as Paul in his behavior, in his practice. Consistent. Now we come to phase three. And this is where it starts getting practical. And we put all this together so we can actually uh, see what bearing what relevance it has for us. What about Paul's theology? What about Paul's teaching? Does Paul have anything to say about baptism, particularly in relation to in whose name it's done and who is the key figure and component that makes baptism actually meaningful and have relevance? We saw his own experience. We saw his own administration of baptism. What about his theology? Well, it's, you might be thinking of a passage in Romans chapter 6, if you're thinking of Romans 6, you're thinking of the right passage. Uh, here's Paul's theology or teaching in relation to baptism. Romans 6 verse 3 and 8 is where we want to focus here. He says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Interesting here, Paul is basically telling us how he was baptized. He's recounting when he says, As so many of us, that's believers, that's Christians, and he includes himself in that group, we were baptized, how? Into Jesus Christ. So when Ananias told Paul, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, he baptized Paul into Jesus Christ. Meaning, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what in the name of the Jesus Christ means. It means into Jesus Christ. Why is that so? He says, because we were baptized into his death. Jesus is the one who died for us. You see, baptism is this interesting dual, uh, you know, ceremony, so to speak. We don't want to turn it into a form, uh, you know, a ceremonial form, but it's this uh, experience that has a dual meaning. It's both a funeral and a resurrection or a birth. A funeral and a resurrection. A, a resurrection is probably more accurate because birth, you know, new life, and it is new life, but you are raised from the dead. It's the same thing. It's a reception of life. A resurrection or a new birth, both have the common denominator of a reception of life. Why is it in the name of Jesus or why is it into Jesus Christ? It's because Jesus is the one who died for us that we might have life. So we are baptized into his death. As Paul says here, verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Here it is, funeral, dying with Christ, living with Christ, resurrection, new birth. Both are because of what Christ did and accomplished. That's why in the book of Acts, you find Luke recording, all these baptisms were done in the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because the apostles understood that. The disciples understood that. Paul experienced that. 
Paul administered that. Paul taught that, that it's all about Jesus. The focus here is on Jesus. It's, it's, I, want, I want to express the importance of it, of, of this, because many times we take baptism for granted. We, we think baptism is simply a ritual where we recite a certain form of words over the person, and, and, and that's it. This is how it's done right. And we think that there is some kind of merit in, in the words that are said and, and the language that is used, and so long as it's done in uh, uh, immersion, underwater, you know, and out, that's it, it's done right. The, the meaning and intent of baptism, brothers and sisters, is so much more. This is basic. This is foundation. This is, this is fundamental. It's about what we say, what, what he says here in this verse. It's about the reception of the life of Christ. That is why the focus is on Christ. It's not just a, a ritual reciting of certain words. We say it this way, we say it that way. This is not what the study is about today. It's not an argument to try and say, well, look at all what they said. We want to make sure we say this or say that. It's about the meaning behind the words that are used, the understanding. You see, when baptism is not just a ritual where, where you know, uh, certain like ancient pagan cultures, you know, incantations and certain uh, rep repetition of certain words has a magical effect, supernatural. Many times Christians think of baptism this way. We've ritualized it. We think we, uh, a certain incantation has to be repeated for baptism to be valid and accurate. Otherwise, if you don't repeat it in such and such way, in this form, it's invalid. If you know what I'm talking about. Paul, Luke, the apostles, the, the teaching of the New Testament shows us that baptism is not about that. Baptism is about a person. It's about dying. You have an experience. You receive something. You die into the death of Christ. You receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. That's the life of Christ. That's why we say it's a funeral and it's a resurrection or it's a new birth. And all of this, all of this is centered not just on Christ, we we'll say Christ Jesus, but Christ specifically as the Son of God. That's the first thing that Paul accepted. That's the for, first thing that Paul preached when he was converted. And Luke is the one who records all of this. If you look at uh, Luke and his record of, in the book of Acts, which is the title of the book. Some people say, well, uh, the book of Acts is really the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, the full title of the book, according to the book, the book itself, is actually the continuing acts of Jesus Christ. Part one of the of the of the two volume book that Luke wrote, part one, which is the gospel of Luke, was the Acts of Jesus Christ, part one. And the book of Acts is the continuing Acts of Jesus Christ, part two. Jesus acted in, in, in the gospel of Luke in person, in the flesh, doing miracles among his disciples, teaching, preaching, and so on. And it's Jesus himself, again, through the book of Acts, who was acting, who was working through his disciples, preaching, healing, doing all this work and spreading. And he's doing this by his spirit. The spirit is not someone other than him. Now, uh, the focus of the early church, because of the continuing acts of Jesus Christ, the focus of the early church was all about Jesus Christ. Uh, it's all about the name of Jesus Christ, specifically, if, if, you, if you recall. Paul was persecuting the name of Jesus Christ. He was fighting against the name of Jesus Christ. Those who claim the name of Jesus Christ. Those who profess the name of Jesus Christ. The disciples preached in the name of Jesus. The disciples healed in the name of Jesus. The disciples were forbidden to preach in the name of Jesus. They were forbidden to, to utter the name of Jesus or to share and spread the name of Jesus. What does that mean? This is not just about what sounds they're making with their lips, okay? to preach in the name of Jesus, to heal in the name of Jesus, when all this focus is about the name of Jesus, it's about the identity of the one who carries that name. In other words, they did all this by the authority and power of the Son of God, the name of Jesus. When Paul was persecuting and fighting against the name of Jesus, then when he was converted, he accepted the name of Jesus. Christ told Ananias that Paul would bear his name before the Gentiles. How he bore the name of Jesus is by preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at that, you find it in Acts chapter 9, if you look at the context. So the name of Jesus is all about the Son of God. And the Son of God is the one through whom we can have this new life. This is why baptism is in the name of the Son of God, in the name of Jesus. This is the, the theological uh, understanding behind it, not just what sounds we make when we administer baptism. I hope you're seeing the, the, the significance here. We're, we're looking at things deeper because Paul says, this is a foundational uh, basic building block upon which we can advance unto perfection. The first verse that we started with in Hebrews, uh, advancing unto perfection. So the apostles preached in the name of Jesus. They healed in the name of Jesus. There was persecution over the name of Jesus, forbidden by the name of Jesus. What else do you think they were doing in the book of Acts in the name of Jesus? Well, baptism as well. That was one of the things they did. It's not just preaching and teaching and healing. 
Baptism was also one of them. And that was also in the name of Jesus. Paul, the apostle chosen to bear the gospel to the Gentiles, was therefore baptized in the name of Jesus. He, we see in the example in Acts 19 in, in Ephesus, he baptized new believers or believers who didn't understand, you know, the full scope of the gospel. He baptized them in the name of Jesus. And in his epistles, we see in his writing, in his theology, in his teaching, he taught people that baptism was dying with Jesus and rising to new life with Jesus. So there is this threefold uh, application of the meaning of the sermon today, the message today, the baptism of Paul. And when you look at all three, you find that they're all related. They're all consistent. And it's all about Jesus because baptism is about life, the life of the son of God. Uh, as I mentioned before as well, uh, there, there, you can do a count, you can do a tally of how many baptisms. But having said that, I, I want to come now to a, a verse that almost everyone listening so far will be thinking of. And, and it is Matt. Matthew 28, 19. So I want to say, well, you made a good case, brother. Yeah, that, that sounds good. That sounds convincing. Yeah, pretty compelling, all these examples. But you didn't cover Matthew 28, 19. What about Matthew 28, 19? Well, let's look at Matthew 28, 19. Because Matthew 28, 19, guess what? Does not contradict what we have found so far. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Let's look at it and see what we can learn and, and just put all these things together. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus' instruction recorded by Matthew now. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Do the words of Jesus here differ or contradict with what we have found in the book of Acts? Certainly not. But this is how sometimes people use them. They say, no, no, baptism has to be done in this way, uh, using and saying the words that Jesus gave in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And people say, well, in the book of Acts, we have the name of Jesus. Which one is it? It is not multiple choice, and it is not one or the other. It is not conflicting with each other. The baptisms recorded in the book of Acts, which were done in the name of the Lord Jesus, are a fulfillment and a carrying out of the instruction of Jesus. What does Jesus mean? First and foremost, to baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Jesus was talking about what the disciples were to do, not what the disciples were to say. Okay, let me be clear. I'll repeat it. Jesus' instruction is about doing something, not saying something. He wasn't telling them, make sure when you baptize people, you say in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to say that, but his instruction, just go by what his instruction is. It was an instruction to do something. When they did that something, that is baptism, they did it in the name of Jesus. Why is that? Because being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means in the authority of heaven, the authority of God, and the authority of God the Father his son, Jesus Christ, and for the reception of the Holy Spirit, guess what? All of that is possible only through the name of Jesus. That's why the disciples, in carrying out this instruction, they did it in the name of Jesus, because that is fulfilling baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Guess what? Jesus came. He said, I am come in my Father's name. If you look at the meaning of the word Jesus, the name Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, it actually has the Father's name in him. Yeshua, the salvation of Yahweh or Jehovah, the salvation of Jehovah, or Jehovah is my salvation. That's what the name Jesus means. So when you baptize, when, when the believers were baptized in the book of Acts, in the name of the Lord Jesus, they were baptized in the name, on the authority of God the Father in Christ. And they were baptized for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? The Spirit is not a different person to Christ. The Spirit is the very presence of Jesus. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So we can't miss this component. The instruction of baptism in Matthew 28, 19 is not more important than what Luke records. And the disciples were not contradicting the instruction of Jesus. They were carrying, carrying, carrying it out. That's what I'm trying to say. Peter was present when, when Jesus spoke as recorded in Matthew. Peter was there. Uh, you know, John was there. Uh, this is how they understood the words of Jesus. So the words of Jesus were not to give his followers a formula, an incantation to recite over the head of the believer as they're entering the water so that something supernatural will happen. Yet so many times, this is how baptism today is treated. And the minister better make sure he say the right words. Look, I, I baptize people, okay? I, I, I know people come up to me and tell me, oh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you said this, you didn't say that, you said the other thing, what's this and what's that? And that uh, betrays an undercurrent of thinking that baptism is some kind of a ritual that has a formulaic, you know, a uh, things in order. You say things this way, that way, it works. If you don't say it this way, that way, guess what? It doesn't work. It's invalid. 
As a matter of fact, some people actually say that unless you baptize and say in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then that baptism is invalid and shouldn't be accepted. That's an extreme position. That's actually fanaticism. Because Jesus' concern with baptism was not what the disciples would say as much as what the disciples would teach and the people who would receive it would understand when it comes to their relation to heaven, to God the Father, to his son Jesus Christ, and the reception of the Spirit. This is what Jesus means. And we see that in the example of the disciples, and particularly today, the focus was in the story of Paul and the baptism of Paul. Having the son is having the father. He's a different person. It's not the same person. Because sometimes people misunderstand this and say, see, you know, uh, oneness and, and Unitarian theology, is particularly oneness, you know, the Jesus only belief. Say, well, Jesus is the Father. Jesus is, of course, himself, the Son. And Jesus is the Spirit. Jesus is all three. So Father, Son, and Spirit, that's Jesus. He's all three. No, the Father is one person. Christ is the Son of God. Jesus speaks to the Father. He prayed to the Father. He was sent by the Father. He, he went back to the Father. He died. The Father didn't die. These are two different individuals, two persons. They're not the same person. Okay? The Spirit then, the Spirit is the personal presence of the Father and the Son because the Father was in Christ and Christ said to his disciples that he will be with them always, even to the end of the world. In his instruction, actually, he told them that. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. That power is the same that he operated with when he was here on earth. And the Bible tells us how God, the Father, anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, healing the sick. So Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and Jesus anoints his disciples with the Spirit. This is how Jesus himself, and the Father is still in him, is with his disciples. So when his disciples would go and expand his kingdom and preach it and share it with others, they would baptize people and bring them under that authority. How is all that possible? What is the gateway to, to bring them to the Father with, through the Son, by the Spirit. What is the gateway through that? It's only through Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So the focus, like I said, many times people get caught up focusing on the words. And this is not an argument over using one form of words over another. Look, like I said, there is nothing wrong with baptizing people saying in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's nothing wrong with that. So long as you have the right understanding. Now, some people use these words with, a, with an incorrect understanding. I realize that. So the focus is on the understanding. And there's nothing wrong with baptizing people in the name of Jesus, so long as you have the right understanding, because it's all about bringing them into union with God so they can receive the life anew of Jesus Christ. And all of this is accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the story of Paul illustrates that very clearly. Now, let's look at uh, another verse that confirms what we found so far in Ephesians 2.18. Beautiful verse. I love how it sums it all up for us. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The hymn here is referring to Christ. It's through Christ that we both, as Jew and Gentile, uh, you know, all, all the, the two classes of society, as far as the Jews were concerned uh, at the time, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. The only way we access the Father is through Jesus, by the one spirit. So Jesus and the spirit are not two different ways to access. Jesus Christ is the spirit by whom we access the Father. That is why baptism in the book of Acts was done in the name of Jesus, because the people were given access to God the Father. That's what it means to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because when you receive Jesus, you have the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's a question of authority. It's a question of power coming into union with God only through Christ. That's why Luke is careful time and again to record how this was done and where the focus is. Now, sometimes people say, well, you baptize in the name of Jesus, you're leaving out uh, God the Father. I had someone tell me this, you know, uh, we, did it, we were doing a baptism one time and said, no, or, what are you going to say? <laughs> they were attending, but they wanted to make sure what's happening before it actually happened. And I told them, well, this is how I baptize people. And they didn't like how I said it. And what I actually say, I'll tell you, this is something we experienced. Some of you, might, some of you here might have been baptized by me or someone else. And at your baptism, this was, this was said. Uh, but what I do, is I, I will say something along the lines of, you know, because of person's faith and commitment to give their life to God uh, and because they accepted the Son of God and so that they might be filled with the Holy Spirit or the gift of the Spirit, uh, they are now baptized or I now baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like I said, it's, it's not a memorized, uh, you know, spiel that I, I recite this, I go into baptism mode, but you, you can see the understanding here. The understanding is it's, it, show, it incorporates all the teaching of the Bible when it comes to Christ's instruction as to what to do and the meaning behind his words when he says, teaching them what I've told you. And the practice and the behavior of the apostles and the disciples, particularly of not, like I said, the apostle Paul today. So by this one spirit, by Christ alone, 
is their access to the Father. This is why baptism was done time and again in the book of Acts, thousands of baptisms in the name of Jesus. Now, I want to I wanna encourage, uh, encourage you here today because there are so many people who, who, who put uh, a burden unnecessarily on others by making these uh, amazing claims that have no support whatsoever. Claims like, well, if you were not baptized in this way or with these words, then your baptism is invalid. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, being baptized, if someone tells you this because you were baptized in the name of Jesus or you were rebaptized in the name of Jesus, like the believers in uh, Acts 19 that we just read about, baptized by Paul in the name of Jesus, that baptism was not invalid. That baptism was recognized by heaven. Praise God. It might, have not recognized, might be not recognized by denominations or people in this world. It was recognized by heaven. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Being baptized in the name of Jesus is not an inferior or an alternate or a better or, or a more accurate way to baptize than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the understanding. So let's not fall into the trap of pitting one against the other because guess what? That impacts the experience. That impacts what people realize when they feel, you know, oh, you've been told, oh, your baptism is invalid. You do it this way, that you do it that way. You end up turning these beautiful realities that Jesus gave, the symbols of these realities, you turn them into a form, into a ritual that only people in particular positions of authority can administer if they say thus and so, and if they don't say thus and so, it's invalid. Who are you to baptize? What did you say? What did you not say? We are ruining the teaching of baptism. So practically here today, the takeaway from this, and I'll go to our last verse in one minute and we'll close with this. The takeaway from this, brothers and sisters, baptism is all about a personal experience where you are transformed, you are changed, you die. Like Christ died, you die into his death, you rise to newness of life. That is why it was carried out and done in the way it was done in the book of Acts. And that is not in conflict with the teachings of Jesus and the instruction of Jesus. That's how the disciples understood it and carried it out. Because in receiving Christ and the life of Christ, you, you actually have the one in whose name he came. When he said, the father dwells in me. And if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we, that's the father and the son, will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's the spirit. That's why, like the, like the verse we just read in Ephesians 2, through this one spirit, by Christ, we have access to the Father. The last verse I, I want to refer to here is, puts it all together beautifully in Galatians 2.20. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the teaching of Paul. This is the theology of Paul. This is the understanding of Paul. Everything was through Christ. And here, when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, I want you to think about this. When he says, I am crucified with Christ, what's he talking about? What's the symbol that is given to us to represent dying or being crucified with Christ? It is baptism. That's what Paul is talking about. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Or in other words, I entered into his death. I was baptized into the death of Christ. I also died with Christ in baptism. That's why baptism is by immersion, where the person goes under the water, which is usually what happens when people die, we bury them under the ground or in the ground. There is a burial, that's baptism, dying, rising to newness of life. That's the symbol. This is why it's done the way it is done. That's why uh, immersion. So baptism is crucified with Christ. No wonder then Paul says that baptism is a foundational doctrine, like we saw in the beginning of our study in Hebrews, that Paul now lives, but it's not Paul alone that lives, but Christ lives within. Brothers and sisters, this is what baptism is about. It's about the reception of Christ. And guess what? To receive Christ in baptism is not when you utter a certain word or a certain phrase and, oh, look, you know, the, the supernatural thing happened because I said these words and, oh, I didn't say these words. Uh, it didn't work. You're treating baptism like magic, like, like some kind of a magical form. You're ruining baptism. Baptism is not something that works if we do something right. It's when the person surrenders and chooses to accept the reality of the life of Christ. And that is all symbolized when the person is baptized in the name of Jesus, fulfilling the instruction that Christ gave to his disciples. This is what it's all about. It's the life of Christ. How is your baptism today? Not how, how was your baptism back then. How is your baptism today? Are you crucified with Christ today? Because that symbol that happened years ago or months ago or wherever it happened in your experience is not something that's a long far gone and that's it baptism being crucified with christ is today i'm not saying be baptized today but the symbol that was represented at your baptism how is it today with you are you walking in this newness of life are you living yet not you but christ is the one that lives in you 
Do you recognize that everything about the gospel and our newness of life is centered in the name of Jesus, in the identity of Jesus, in, in the sonship of Jesus to his father? This is the only link we have with God. This is how we can receive the gift of the spirit. Now, like I said, this investigative study really leads us to this conclusion, to this point. It helps us understand why the disciples did what they did and why Paul received that baptism this way, why he administered that way, why he taught about it this way. It's for the very purpose of what he quotes here in Galatians 2. So that that's the experience of everyone. So that we live in the flesh, but it's not us that live, but Christ lives in us. This is the, the wonder and the reality of the meaning of baptism. So let's not get caught up in the forms, in the rituals, in getting argumentative over saying this or saying that, or you said it this way, I didn't say it this way. No, you're over here. Don't come here. We don't recognize you. This is ruining the gospel and ruining the meaning of baptism. The reality, brothers and sisters, is much more beautiful. It is the life of Christ, the reception of the life of Christ. You can't put a formula to, to, to an incantation to make that happen. That is received by faith in him. Let this be our experience. I pray that it will be a renewed reminder and uh, as a result, a deepening experience for you today as a result of the study that it was a blessing. Let's close with a word of prayer. I'll invite you to join me if you are able. Loving Father, we are so thankful for the gift of salvation in Jesus. And in a special way, Father, we are thankful for what Jesus has done 2,000 years ago in the life of this man called Paul. That through his influence, through his work, and how you work through him, his, this blessing has been imparted to the world that we even uh, talk about it today, that we are here be, uh, together to a large degree because of how you used this man in the past. I pray that we will be like Paul, faithful, that we might be used in a way that will impact others, that they might also have a closer walk with Jesus. I pray this for each and everyone here, everyone listening, Lord, that we might be found uh, as Paul was, faithful, uh, carrying your name faithfully in these closing scenes of earth's history. May the, the, the doctrine, the teaching of baptism be truly understood in its basic fundamental uh, uh, simplicity, as the scripture points out today, and may it be a, a renewed experience for each and every one of us that we might, as Paul says, live, yet not us who live, but Christ lives in us because we have died into the death of Christ. We rise to this newness life of him, uh, the son of God, the precious name, which is given above every name. We ask this Lord and thank you for hearing us in that wonderful name of your only begotten son, Jesus. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, Turn notifications on and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.